You must have other reasons to come see me beyond mere history lessons, Keeper. Most of what I have mentioned has been discussed, probably to a more elaborate degree than anything that I can provide. Consider it a curiosity, Ambassador. Perhaps you do not possess the keen political and historical insight of this galaxy's scholars, but you do have one thing that they do not. And I suppose that is because I lived through it? Far more than that, Ambassador, you were directly involved in the event's inception. At the beginning, maybe, but I had other obligations at the time that took me away from such duties. Does it have to do with your daughter? Yes, it did. My apologies, I meant no offence. No, it's... Sighs. It's something I don't care to dwell on. Understandable, there was much turmoil during those times. I can't imagine the burden it must have placed on you, the first Nereid to interact with humans, and to mother a child from them no less. Turmoil is a fitting word, Keeper, but I'm sensing that you wish to speak of my relationship with humans rather than the turbulence of those times. More specifically, your relationship with a particular human. I have received numerous responses from the other galactic powers, but beyond a brief encounter mentioned from the Thulu, I have yet to truly hear of any first-hand accounts of a singular human which is why your case is particularly of interest. Because of my relationship with my husband, correct? Yes. Well, I suppose your interest is warranted, but I am hardly the only Nereid to engage in a relationship with a human. Perhaps, but you are the first. And with that, I thought it best to extend the courtesy to you before the others. Well, I appreciate the gesture, Keeper. However, what do you wish to hear? That I saw him and immediately felt some sort of raw, primal attraction to him, that I was drawn to his mere presence as he looked at me from across the room. If that is accurate to what you felt, then yes. Well, gladly, it was none of those things. The first time I met my husband, I tried to kill him. Pardon? smiles. I suppose to fully understand the context of that I should explain a bit of my situation beforehand, unless that is of inconvenience to you, Keeper. Not at all. Please elaborate as much as possible. Well noted. As we have already established in the times before the war, we Nereids would go off on pilgrimages to the Poro systems, the only part of the galaxy that we could freely travel about without the concern of Empire rule. What that entailed, however, was always different for each of us. Some of us chose to participate in the market, others merely acted as tourists, travelling around the systems for a short time before heading back home, Many of us chose to be entertainers, and, with our appeal to a large number of the inhabitants at that time, that was often the more popular choice for those among us that wished for a longer stay within the Poro systems. There were a few of us, however, that found ourselves pursuing a more dangerous occupation. I assume you are familiar with Furies? Yes, Nereid combatants who specialize in the use of their psionic abilities, correct? That you are. It is a more organized group nowadays, but back then it was what we called ourselves as we made a name for ourselves in the Poros systems. We were nothing more than mercenaries for hire, of course. But some of us acted under a code of conduct. I did my best to abide by such rules, but in the Poros systems it is difficult to say who or what is truly innocent. As you can imagine, our psionic abilities gave us an edge in combat. You do not need cover if you can deflect or catch projectiles with a simple telekinetic field, and pulling someone from behind a wall is not particularly difficult once you get the hang of it. As a result, Furies were under quite the demand during those times, and it paid a nice sum to work as one. Of course it was always dangerous, but for the particularly gifted members of my species, it was a steady job with a wealth of income. 
I remember when I was a little one, I always thought they told the best stories, and that is what made me wish to be one when I started my own pilgrimage. Combat often carries a ring of glory to it. It does, but reality can be a cruel mistress. And when you've hunted down dozens of spike dealers and toppled a few drug lords at another's behest, you realize that the stories you've been told amounted to only one or two encounters that, when embellished on, will wow some young girl into fantasies you never intended for her to have. Or perhaps that was just my own views of it. Many others seemed to enjoy the profession. Whether or not it was because they were in an environment where they could finally let loose, I did not know. All I knew was that after a while started to feel it wear on me. I didn't know when, but the time I was going to go home was coming up soon if it kept up. And it didn't, if I am correct to assume. Smiles. It didn't, though like I said, it wasn't in the way you would suspect. I was hired for a job, a rather innocuous one as far as the dynamics of the Poros systems were concerned, but the client seemed particularly invested in its execution that I felt somewhat of a need to offer my help. And this job was a hit job against a rather shady businessman by the name of Rao Kazan. I suppose shady is a redundant phrase when talking of the Poros systems themselves, but apparently the Salian had exploited a number of traders and weaseled out of paying them what they were owed, and they were out for blood. Assassination seems to be a bit of an overstep for bad business dealings. Nowadays, I would be more inclined to agree with you, but I was of a different mindset during those days. More sensitive, you could say. They had brought out their families, their children, to plead for my help. Looking back, it was an absurd situation. The traders themselves should have not decided to start a family in such a fluctuating environment, not to mention such a lawless one. But there they were, and my younger self felt inclined to help them. Would you not have done the same now? I suppose I still would. I have a soft spot for children— but my help would have been getting them out of the poorer systems and into a more stable environment. We Nereid were no fan of the Empire at that time, don't get me wrong, but it was a far more reasonable situation for raising a family. If you wanted to make a name for yourself out in the Poros, it was best to go at it alone, without attachments that could be exploited. Yet somehow, these traders managed to exploit your emotions anyways. Laughs are all keepers this blunt. To an extent, though my people have told me I am of a looser tongue than they. And they would be right. Though I cannot say I don't prefer it, makes this process far less one-sided. But I should get back on track. Yes, the traders most likely played up my own emotions to get me to agree to the job. And while the pleading children certainly had their effect, I was more looking for a reason to keep doing what I was doing. Hunting down and eliminating a dishonest businessman was nothing new to me, but it had gotten to the point where the action was mechanical. It was devoid of meaning, and it was due to that that I may have let their pleading be far more effective than it would have normally have. Because it gave the action meaning? Precisely. No longer was it just business as usual. Now I was an avatar of a pleading family's vengeance, it rung of something the stories I heard as a little girl had, but as I look back on it all, I realize it was just myself wishing to justify the actions of someone whose life had mainly revolved around continuous combat. It was foolish, but it did what it was intended to do. I found Rao on the planet of Seribai. It was a sparsely populated planet, mainly composed of species that migrated from the Empire but the low attention that it drew made it an ideal location to conduct business dealings for the lesser-known merchants. Rao wasn't someone that I would call a lesser merchant, which is why his arrival to the planet had generated some noise among my sources. I was under the impression that Thulus held dominance over the market in the Poro systems. That may be true, 
but the galaxy is a big place, and the Poro systems themselves are quite expansive. There is only so much that one species can cover, especially on so secretive, and that allows some other species to fill in the crack, so to speak. Salians especially were especially good at this and ran a sort of shadow collective under the Thulu's own network. A shadow within a shadow seems like a hard prospect to manage. I'm sure it is, but Salians happen to be one of the craftier species in the galaxy and some of the less, let us say, boisterous kind that inhabited the systems at the time. They knew where to stop pressing their influence, and that often meant that their methods would either go undetected, or the Thulus would find out and simply determine that what they were doing was of no threat to them. They weren't as daring as, say, the humans, who when they entered the market took it upon themselves to challenge the Thulus directly. That is an entirely different sort of interaction. The general trade network between Salians is pretty decentralized, but every now and then a few prominent members arise from it to a decent amount of reputation, and Rao was one such person. Of course his methods weren't of the most noble kind, as evidenced by the fact that I was hired to kill him by his own workers, but you can imagine that kind of a reputation generally involves a lot of security. Wouldn't that draw too much attention? Yes, it would, but Rao must have let his reputation get to his head. He had a lot of men, to be sure, but it was fairly easy to find him on Cerebi as soon as I arrived. Of course, that many men required a certain degree of preparation. And assistance? Not in this case. Most mercenaries in the Poros systems are driven by only one thing only, and that is credits. Odds were that if I were to bring anyone along with me to attack Rao, he could have easily just offered to pay more than my clients had, and that would have been it. Whether or not he would have shot them instead of paying them was another thing entirely, but that is the trouble with mercenaries. They're pretty easy to sway. But not you? Like I said, some Furies operated on a code of conduct, and the first condition of that was to never betray your client. That seems like an easily abused tenet. Perhaps, but that is why it is important to screen your clientele in the first place. If you just accept any job without thinking, you'd end up doing things that you don't quite agree with. Of course, there are a number of my kind that don't care about such things either way and take any job they can. I want to say I was different, but in such a lawless place as the Poros systems, it is often hard to tell what is what and who is truly in the wrong. In this case, however, there was a clear divide, at least I believed there was. You speak as if the traders that hired you had different intentions. Consider it a realistic look back on the situation. It is hard to take much in the poorer systems at face value, and while I may have been swayed by their emotional plight, there was always a part of me that considered that the traders had ulterior motives. And they most likely did. But at the time I had only pushed such concerns to the back of my mind. So there were a large amount of guards, and you were on your own. How did you get your job done? Well, obviously, considering the numbers, a full frontal assault would be ill-advised. A Nereid fury may indeed be powerful, but numbers do matter to an extent, and Rao had enough numbers to make up for my abilities. But when operating in the Poros systems, it helps to have a skill set that goes beyond mere combat, and as you say now, I happen to have a few diplomatic skills that assisted me in my endeavor. Diplomatic skills? I suppose it would fall more under the lines of manipulation, but yes. One of them was bound to give sooner or later, but I suspected that if Palladius did give, it would be in the form of a rain of gunfire. This was, of course, what I was looking for. Throughout their negotiations, I had directly or indirectly planted a few pieces of misinformation that would ensure tensions to rise between the two. That sounds fairly complicated. It wasn't really, especially when dealing with two polar opposites.
drop an anonymous tip that Rao would be more willing on such day to come to a compromise that favours Palladius, and he goes into the negotiations with heightened expectations. When such expectations aren't met, the tensions start to rise. Do the same with Rao, and inform one of his men that Palladius may show some give, and he'll become more aggressive in his negotiations, which in turn only angers Palladius even more. Sweet talk both the Salians and Jorakin's men to get an idea of their mental states, and change your messages accordingly. It does not stop there, however, for more often than not, the men under these individuals will be of an entrepreneurial mindset. They would be there only for the money and nothing more. To that effect, it would be naive to think that they would follow the orders of their respective leaders if tensions between them ever rose so high to where they would order their men to kill each other. So to counteract this, you have to create an emotional investment. Given that the men under each's command were of a simple sort, general hearsay of insults or mockery was enough to get them going. But even better was find small connections between the men on opposing sides to find the smallest threads to exploit and cause conflict. Say one men of Paldius is new, one of the men under Rao from way back. If you just so happen to let it slip that the ex-loved one of one of the men left him for the other, that kind of information creates divide, especially if the people in question happen to be Phoenicians, whose marital bonds are often treasured more so than other species. It did not matter if such information was true or not, because at that point these men were already far from home, and given the nature of communications at the time, there would be no way to confirm nor deny such information without waiting for a couple of weeks. That is only one example, however, as there happened to be quite a few avenues for me to find out and inflame for my purposes. This process sounds like it would take a long time. It did, but like I said, Rao was a patient individual and had brought enough men with him to make Palladius cautious about assaulting him. Also, a simple firefight between the two over simple negotiations was not going to happen, regardless of my own efforts. What it did, however, was win tensions so tight that it would take nothing more than a simple push to set things off. And I assume you were the one doing the pushing. You say push. I would say it was more akin to setting off a spark in a room packed with flammable gas. There was a very different feel to the air that day, one that gave off the sense that even had I not done anything, something was about to happen. But to be certain, I planned on instigating the situation anyways. To that effect, my plan held two stage. First, I would escalate conflict between Rao's and Palladius's men, then I would go after Rao himself in the resulting chaos. What made you certain that Rao and Palladius wouldn't just tell their men to stand down should it escalate into armed conflict? It very much plays into the tensions that were already formed by the time my machinations had fully taken effect. At that point, Rao was most likely seeing Palladius as a nuisance, and Palladius would see the Salian as a pest that was toying with him. Should conflict start, especially in such a lawless land, it would provide a good opportunity to cut off a potential threat without the fear of law behind them. Palladius was hardly the only mercenary leader in the Cerebi cluster that held some power, just the one that held the most. If he knocked him off, it would be simple to negotiate with the person attempting to fill the void, and possibly from a higher position of power. This talk with Palladius was more of a formality to that extent, an attempt to come to a deal without the need for burdensome combat. By then, however, the Salian was most likely very much in the mindset of removing Palladius, and the Jurakin would be aiming for Rao's head. With the mercenaries themselves, it was very much the same deal, a chance to settle grudges and give someone theirs without consequence. They were just waiting for someone to fire, and I was happy to oblige them. My opportunity came in the form of a small argument that occurred right outside the complex where Rao and Palladius were conducting their operations.
I did not know what exactly they were arguing about, but one of the men had drawn his side arm as was waving it about threateningly, and that was the spark. As you are new to this galaxy, I suppose I could give a brief explanation of psionics to help you understand its capabilities, if you would prefer that, of course. I would, but please, only a small explanation is necessary. I believe there is a keeper on Agea as we speak, gathering all of the necessary information. You work quick. Anyways, a brief explanation, I can do that. Psionics, depending on the ability of the user, can vary the distance it can reach. Consider the normal psionic field to be a small sphere of influence that sits around the user. For a myriad of average ability, that sphere extends to around two meters. Within that range, it is possible to manipulate any object within that field with basic telekinesis. If one wished to extend this range, however, they could bring that psychic field within themselves and spread it out in a more focused pattern. Depending on the amount of focus, that range could go up to between 20 to 100 meters. What this limits, however, is the psychic strength of the psionics themselves, which generally limits it to a manipulation of a singular small object at a distance. For me, with a slightly above average psionic strength, that range was ideal for me. I positioned myself at a building across from the meeting complex, witnessing the confrontation go down. The mercenary waving his gun around had placed his hand on the trigger, which, given his supposed professional status, seemed like a highly egregious error. One that worked in my favor, for as soon as he did, I sent out a thread of my psionic field and wrapped it around his finger, forcing him to squeeze the trigger. The resulting plasma burst didn't hit anyone, but that was enough provocation for the opposing side to draw their weapons and open fire. It took a while, but eventually the whole building was encapsulated by instances of combat, which I took as my chance to get into the base. I encountered little resistance going through the base, though both Rouse and Palladius's men found me equally an enemy. I would imagine that would provide some difficulties, given that you were outnumbered. Had there been enough men, I'd be inclined to agree with you, but it was mostly groups of three or four that I had to deal with, which was well within my capabilities. Our psionics give us an obvious edge in combat. Deflecting plasma bursts, or rather dissipating them before they hit you, as well as throwing enemy combatants to the side, become instinctual with enough practice, and since the entire process in mental, it can be conducted before most people have time to react. Given that all of that, however, I encountered less and less resistance as I walked deeper into the complex, as most of the fighting had gathered towards the outer edges. Whether or not this was just luck on my part, or due to the orders of their respective leaders, I did not know, but there was something peculiar I encountered as I made my way deeper into the building. What would that be? Traps, around a dozen, all explosive. They were usually arranged in different location, each hidden behind furniture or directly around corners, but not hidden well enough for me to believe that these were set up ahead of time. Whoever did lay them out was in a rush to retreat, which meant it was either Rao and some of his men, or Palladius. It was much like a trail of breadcrumbs, explosive breadcrumbs to be sure, but still just as much an indicator of a potential target's location. The traps only slowed my progress in the end, and I eventually found myself standing at what looked to be a shipyard of sorts, a small one for personal craft that served more for planetary travel. Rao was off in the distance, retreating towards a dropship on the opposite end of the yard. Next to him was someone dressed in dark blue armor. They wore a helmet that covered their face, so I couldn't tell what species they were, but from the broadness of their shoulders, I assumed them to be a man. He looked back towards me and aimed his weapon. When he fired, I was once again caught off guard. How so?
projectile-based weapons are of no surprise to anyone in this galaxy, but eventually each species appeared to have moved on from such weapons for more efficient means of combat. Plasma became popular in the Empire because their power cells only required a cool down instead of a reloading, which meant that their troops would have to carry less onto the battlefield, suiting their usual quick and clean style, whereas the species in the Poros systems had settled on particle-based weapons instead because generally they generated enough force to where, if the initial blast didn't kill you, the resulting push of force would at least immobilize you momentarily. There were, of course, some other types of weapons, depending on the species, but for the most part, at the time, those were the most well-known and preferred options. What did you prefer? Nowadays, I'd be more inclined to use my own species technology, given that it has been developed specifically for our abilities, but such tech didn't exist back then. I was rather fond of Thulu weaponry, however, as it meshed as well as it could with my own abilities. But as I was saying, beyond the initial burst of gunfire letting off a crack I never associated with Thulu or Empire weaponry, the most shocking thing came when the projectiles bypassed my psionic shield entirely. Given that I wasn't familiar with the weapon's make, I assumed it was the same as much of the weapons found in the Poro systems, and had adjusted my field accordingly. I had been prepared to disperse or deflect any plasma or laser bolts, but not a fully solid projectile, one fired far faster than anything that I had seen before. Luckily my shield had adjusted the course of the bullets somewhat, with only one of them grazing past my face. My moment of shock was only for a second, and before the man could get another shot off, I reached out and snatched the weapon from his hands with a psionic thread. He didn't miss a beat, drawing his sidearm as soon as I pulled the rifle from him and firing a few shots towards me. I did my best to deflect the shots, but since I had no experience dealing with type of weaponry, one still managed to hit me in the shoulder. I dropped his rifle in the process and only barely managed to find cover before he snatched it back up and kept a steady stream of fire to pin me down. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted Rao getting close to his dropship and I will admit, felt a flash of anger looking at the man who had halted my advance. I unleashed a full blast of psionic energy at my opponent, catching him in the chest and sending him flying back some ways off down the shipyard. Whether or not that did any damage I didn't know, because he soon rolled back behind a ship and out of my sight. I made a dash towards Rao, but was intercepted by grenade. I caught it with my own psionic abilities, trying to return it back to the man who threw it at me, but as I did, he shot it out of the air. The resulting explosion didn't burn me as I kept up a psionic shield to block most of the immediate damage, but the shockwave of the blast still kicked me back and into the hull of another ship. This man you were fighting, he seems skilled. Oh, he was. After that little maneuver I had to acknowledge that much. But more than that, I was just angry at how stubborn he was being. Rao was in the process of getting into his ship, and this man had stalled me enough to where I wasn't sure if I was going to catch up in time. He was more daring than I had given him credit for, however, for soon after I started to get back up, he emerged from his cover, rifled pointed at my head. He stood a ways away, however, which I didn't know if it was because of some calculated maneuver of his or sheer caution of my abilities. If he did have an idea of what my abilities encompassed, it wasn't a complete one, because he stood within enough range for me to ensnare him within one of my psionic threads and pull him into the full range of my powers. He fired a few shots, sure, but at that point it was more of a panicked reaction, easy to dodge and deflect, even if I hadn't any idea of the functions of his weapon. When he was fully in my range, I held him up in the air with my mental grasp, rendering him immobile. Which is far harder than it sounds, especially with this man. He was struggling, but it, while it provided an extra bit of mental strain, it wasn't enough to break my grasp. Rao's dropship was starting up, and it looked very much like the Salian was ready to abandon the man to my own sense of personal vengeance,
Our conflict was cut short, however, because the door to the shipyard slammed open, drawing my attention away from the man for only a split second. It was enough for him to move his arm, rather than his whole body, and before I managed to restrain him, he'd pulled something from his waist and thrown in at me. There was a large flash of light, like the sun had just been set off right in front of my eyes, and my hearing was filled with a dull, ringing noise that drowned everything else out. I put up a psionic shield in a hurry, much to my benefit, because a second explosion followed soon after the flash, kicking me back quite a ways away. The blast further disoriented me, and it felt like I would never see again at the rate my vision was recovering. But it eventually did, and it was just in time to see Palladius standing over me. He wasn't directing his attention at me, at least not yet. Instead, he was yelling something at that I, to me, only sounded like a low rumble. Rao's ship had taken off, and I saw that the man I was fighting had made it onto the vessel, looking out its open door as it started to lift off. Palladius then looked down at me, his eyes full of rage. I would like to say that I easily pushed him back with a psionic blast, but in this case it wouldn't have mattered if my mind was cleared enough to use my psionics in the first place for the Jurakin, given their bulk and size, have a predisposed physical resistance to most forms of conventional firearms. Their rock-like skin makes them resistant to a number of firearms even out of armor, but to have an armored one staring down on you... It was very much like looking down the barrel of a tank. Palladius grabbed me by the throat and held me in the air with his strength, and while I was trying my best to manifest even the smallest amount of psionic strength, everything was happening too fast for me to react to in time. His grip tightened, and with any more force he could have crushed my throat easily. And going off the look in his eyes, he was going to do just that. He had a rage that needed to be sated, and I was the unlucky one that fell at his feet. Fortunately, as you can see, that did not happen, and it was very much due to the man I had just been fighting with. He somehow assisted you? Yes. Right as my vision started to fade once again, I heard the crack of gunfire break through the ringing in my ears. Palladius's grip loosened on my neck as that happened, and I fell to the ground coughing as the Jorikin clutched at his chest. He'd been shot, but by a weapon that generated enough force to break through both his armor and his skin. I shot a glance at the dropship at that moment, enough to see that the man had kept his weapon aimed in my direction, the tip of its barrel glowing with a red-hot glow. His helmet was off then, and though he was some distance away, I could see that he was a human. I didn't have much time to take in his features, however, as I still had to make my own escape. To that effect, I hit Palladius with a concentrated blast of psionic power. It was only enough to knock him off his feet, but it bought me enough time to escape deeper into the complex and make my way out of the combat zone in the midst of all the chaos. I didn't waste my time staying on planet either. Palladius was going to be out for blood, and I didn't feel like being in his crosshairs for any longer than I had to. The mission, for now, was a failure, but I was alive, which was more than I could have hoped for in that situation. So, this man you encountered, from what I can infer, he was the one who would eventually become your husband? Husband-to-be, yes, and I know what you're thinking. How could I ever end up with a man who almost killed me himself? The truth is that I honestly did feel somewhat irritated at the man. He'd screwed up what would have been an overall flawless plan, interfered to such an extent that it put my own life in danger. But he had also saved me. I didn't know why he did, but I couldn't deny his aid in that situation. I wouldn't say that I owed the man anything, but I was curious after that encounter, and I had plenty of questions, questions that were going to be answered far sooner than I imagined.